Should we fail to replace New Start, we would, for the first time since 1972, live in a world without limits on the world's two largest nuclear arsenals. I personally don't want to live in that kind of world. That's the voice of Jess Rogers, an impact fellow at the Federation of American Scientists. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now here are your co-hosts, Tom Kalina and Lauren Billett. Thanks, Angela, and welcome back to Press the Button. Good morning, Tom. We have made it to Press the Button Live Week. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And I'm excited to share with everybody that Press the Button Live Nuclear Policy in Crisis is happening at 3 p.m. Eastern Time this Wednesday, November 16th, over Zoom and in person in D.C. Moderators include our very own Plowshares Fund President, Dr. Emma Belcher, Elizabeth Warner, Tom Kalina, you, Tom, and Ben Rhodes. And stellar guests include International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Raphael Grossi, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, former President of Ireland Mary Robinson, Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control Mallory Stewart, and many more. We'll discuss the risk of nuclear war in Ukraine, the future of arms control, the Iran deal, North Korea, and lots of other subjects. It's going to be a great event, so we hope you can join us. To get more information and to RSVP for the in-person or virtual event, visit our website at plowshares.org. Well, Tom, aside from that, we have to get back to the normal content of our podcast. What do you have for us on the nuclear front? Well, it's nice to have some good news to share today. The Biden administration has announced it will restart nuclear arms control discussions with Russia. The talks are expected to take place in Cairo in the near future and are the first move by both sides to discuss arms control since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine in February. The talks will seek to resume inspections under the New START Treaty, which were suspended due to the pandemic. And the hope is that if the talks go well, they can be expanded to exploring replacing the New START Treaty, which is set to expire in 2026. So our fingers are crossed. Meanwhile, the UN's nuclear watchdog reported that Iran continues to block its investigation into Iran's past nuclear activities. The UN also said that Iran continues to increase its highly enriched uranium stockpile, and the agency cautioned that it was no longer able to verify the exact size of Iran's stockpile due to the restrictions Tehran has imposed on the UN inspections back in February. And Lauren, what's up next on Early Warning? This week on Early Warning, Alex Hall talks with our very own Dr. John Carl Baker, our senior program officer here at Plowshares Fund. They discuss the possibility of an upcoming North Korean nuclear test, the uptick of missile alerts, and more. And then I sit down with Jess Rogers, an impact fellow at the Federation of American Scientists. We discuss different options for saving arms control after New START expires in 2026 and what the world could look like if we don't replace the last U.S.-Russia nuclear treaty we have left. It's a great conversation, so please stay tuned. And if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Your feedback helps us to improve the show. And with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning, early warning, early warning, early warning. warning a seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Jacqueline. North Korea has set an annual record for missile launches back in June, and tests are still continuing. In a single day last week, they launched 23 missiles, setting a new daily record, and U.S. officials expect that North Korea is prepared to conduct a nuclear test, which we could expect any week. In a newly released nuclear posture review, the Biden administration stated that, quote, any nuclear attack by North Korea against the United States or its allies and partners is unacceptable and will result in the end of that regime. There is no scenario in which the Kim regime could employ nuclear weapons and survive, end quote. So what does this all mean? Today, we are joined by Dr. John Carl Baker, the nuclear field coordinator and senior program officer and my colleague here at Plotters Fund. John Carl, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. So what's the latest on the Korean Peninsula? 
Well, like you said, they have fired more than 30 missiles in just the past few weeks. They've launched more in 2022 than in any previous year. One launch last month overflew Japan. And at the same time this is happening, the U.S. and South Korea have conducted some joint military exercises, which North Korea doesn't like and feels the need to respond to with things like launches and other provocative activities. So it's a pretty worrisome dynamic that's happening on the peninsula right now. The Biden administration has offered repeatedly to talk to North Korea without preconditions, but the North is so far refusing to talk with them. So the administration doesn't really have a diplomatic avenue. So instead, they're trying to emphasize their deterrence capabilities and showcasing the power of the U.S.-South Korea alliance. But in turn, this leads North Korea to emphasize its own capabilities through missile tests and fiery rhetoric. So there's a kind of action-reaction dynamic happening that doesn't seem to be going anywhere good. This is happening at the same time that both sides have the policy, both sides being North and South Korea, both sides have the policy that they would go first in a conflict. The North has a new nuclear posture that reserves the right to preemption in certain circumstances. And the South has plans for preemptive conventional strikes against, for instance, the DPRK leadership in the case of an an imminent attack. So you can see quite clearly there that there's a lot of potential for miscalculation or for accident uh, on both sides. Do you think that it's likely that North Korea is going to conduct a nuclear test anytime soon? Well, it hasn't happened yet. But by all accounts, the U.S. government, the South Korean government, open source analysts on the outside, The North Koreans seem to be ready to go. The test site is prepped and the DPRK seems to have laid all the groundwork to conduct a test. It doesn't mean absolutely that it's going to happen. And many people had assumed it would happen by now and it hasn't. But the expectation, as I understand it, is still that they're going to test. It just depends on whether and when Kim Jong-un gives the order. So with all this international focus on the war in Ukraine, the world's attention has been a bit consumed by Russia's nuclear threats. What impact do you think this is having on North Korea's stance and testing right now? Well, it's unclear whether there's a true causal relationship, but it is true that North Korea has engaged in a historic level of missile tests this year, which is the same year that Russia is prosecuting its brutal war in Ukraine. I don't really think the invasion emboldened North Korea in the way that is often talked about. But there does seem to be some anecdotal evidence that they're growing a little bit closer diplomatically to Russia, which, along with China, now seems less likely to rebuke them for things like missile tests and maybe even nuclear tests. But we'll have to wait until there is a nuclear test, if there is one, to see how China and Russia will react. So on that note, a North Korean nuclear launch would be the end of the regime, according to the U.S. Nuclear Posture Review. How do you think the U.S. would actually respond to a nuclear test by North Korea? I think they probably will express pretty firm public opposition. They'll do it in coordination with their partners in the region, like South Korea and Japan. And they probably will do what they have been doing, which is ramp up demonstrations of the alliance's deterrence capabilities. There may also be an attempt to add more sanctions. But like I said, China and Russia don't seem very inclined to go along. So if they wanted to add sanctions, they'd have to do it unilaterally, which means they won't really have as much bite as others. Furthermore, they won't really do anything to actually address the problem of the North's nuclear weapons program. Sanctions have kind of become the go-to mechanism for pressuring the DPRK government. And in theory, economic pressure is supposed to push them to the negotiating table and slow the progress of the program. But the Kim government has shown time and time again that it's willing to suffer through sanctions if that means it can have nuclear weapons. And remember, this isn't a new program. Uh, The DPRK has had nuclear weapons for more than 15 years now. This isn't a bare bones nuclear weapons program. It's a highly sophisticated one with many different types of missiles, including ICBMs that can hypothetically reach the United States. Sanctioning the DPRK makes U.S. policymakers feel like they're doing something. But it's not going to stop this advancement. Only uh, diplomacy with them and ultimately some kind of diplomatic agreement with the North that probably includes some things the U.S. really doesn't want to do is going to be the thing that constrains and limits their program. But right now, of course, the North Koreans aren't talking. So let's hope they change their mind soon. And that if they do, the Biden administration will be willing to deal with them. 
Thanks so much, John Carl. We will certainly keep following this closely and bring our listeners more updates as developments continue. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Shing, the Communications and Marketing Specialist at Plowshares Fund. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has exposed just how close nuclear escalation and nuclear war can be. To meet the urgency of this moment, Plowshares Fund has launched a donation match challenge to make the largest grants possible to those who are working every day to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons. Right now, all first-time gifts will be matched dollar for dollar, and all new monthly gifts will be matched at their 12-month value. Or, increase your giving and the full amount above your last gift will be matched. Go to plowshares.org slash donate today. And thanks for listening. Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine has had many casualties, and the latest may be nuclear arms control. There is only one U.S.-Russian nuclear treaty left, New START. It entered into force in 2011 and was extended last year, but it expires in 2026. Talks to work on a replacement were canceled after Russia's invasion. Now, 2026 may seem far away, but four years to negotiate an arms control treaty is not a lot particularly given current U.S.-Russian relations and the issues that need to be resolved. And even if we could get an agreement, there's the small problem of getting it through the U.S. Senate, where bipartisan support for anything is hard to find. Could we be facing the end of arms control, and what would that world look like? To help us look ahead, we're joined by Jess Rogers, a treaty lawyer and policy analyst. She co-authored a great recent article in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists called The Long View, Strategic Arms Control After the New START Treaty, which she wrote with Matt Korda and Han Christensen from the Federation of American Scientists, where she is an impact fellow. Jess, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. So after 50 years of bilateral arms control with Russia, there is just one treaty left standing, New START, and it expires in 2026. So let's start with the basics. What does New START cover? Why is it so important? New START really is the cornerstone of strategic stability between Russia and the US, so the two largest nuclear weapon states. It's so important because first, it limits the US and Russian deployed long range nuclear forces, so the ones that can re- uh, reach each other's homelands to no more than 1,550 warheads and 700 delivery vehicles. So these are the lowest numbers that we've had in over 60 years. And it took a long time to get here and many treaties in the interim. It also limits deployed and non-deployed launchers to 800. So this, for instance, prevents Russia from building and storing unlimited numbers of mobile missile launchers But it also gives the U.S. some wiggle room to convert bombers to conventional use, to overhaul submarines, while those do not count under the 700 deployed limit. But perhaps most importantly, the New START Treaty has verifiable limits. So these aren't just anything that we are hoping, aspiring to. These are limits that have to be met, and we are able to actually prevent cheating through this gold standard of verification that the New START Treaty has. So this verification regime allows us to in real time track our nuclear forces. So we can track Russia's nuclear forces. They can track ours on a real time basis, um, the ones at least that are accountable under the treaty. And it also provides for up to 18 annual short notice on-site inspections So that way we can have actual boots on the ground to verify the data provided through these treaty notifications. It's also still being implemented. So it's the one treaty, like you mentioned, that is still working. The good news is that so far, even while these on-site inspections have been paused and we haven't had a bilateral consultative commission meeting in a while, The other verification measures of the New START Treaty have continued to work, and they give us a certain level of predictability. So most recently, on September 1st, we had the regular biannual exchange that, you know, we gave each other our numbers for the treaty accountable weapons and delivery 
systems. And Russia has also continued notifying us about the movements of their nuclear forces as required under the treaty. So that has prevented potential escalation during um, the war in Ukraine. So what happens if we fail to replace New START? What does that world look like? Should we fail to replace New START, we would, for the first time since 1972, live in a world without limits on the world's two largest nuclear arsenals. I personally don't want to live in that kind of world. I don't know about you, Tom. I do want to caution that even if a follow-on treaty fails to be ready by February 2026, there is a little bit of hope. So in the past, other strategic arms control treaties have not always been ready in time. And there are some reasonable options for bridging at least short treaty list periods while negotiations are completed. But if there is no follow on framework in sight, the longer we are without these verifiable limits, the more uncertainty military planners will have to deal with. And so without those verified limits, Russia and the US would really lose the mutual predictability that they need to limit their strategic nuclear forces. Before we get into sort of the options of the way forward, as we mentioned, Russia's invasion of Ukraine disrupted the ongoing US-Russian talks to try to get to a new treaty. As you look at this, under what conditions do you think those talks could resume? Yeah, the first step here really is that Russia and the U.S. need to get the inspections under the current treaty to resume as soon as possible. So the newly announced BCC, Bilateral Consultative Commission meeting in Cairo, which I think is scheduled for late November, early December now, is the right place to get this sorted out. The U.S. has previously not been very concrete, and so this Um, condition of having the inspections resume is pretty much the one concrete conditions that the U.S. has placed on resuming talks to negotiate a follow-on treaty. So now that we've seen a little bit of signaling that President Biden said on September 21st that no matter what else is happening in the world, the United States is ready to pursue critical arms control measures. Now we have this BCC meeting scheduled. We have said we need inspections to resume first. I think now I'm feeling a little bit more optimistic that we might be getting somewhere in the future. The question, however, is can we really resolve this in this one BCC meeting? Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov did say that he believes it would take more than a few days, so more than just one meeting to get this problem sorted out. Um, But I do know this is really something that the Biden administration has made a huge priority to get this happening. And if we do manage to resume inspections, I don't know if perhaps the administration might want to conduct a certain number of inspections first before initiating talks on a fall on treaty. It's not clear to me what the timeline will look like here. But I do hope that both sides realize how essential these talks are and how little time is left to negotiate the follow-on treaty. Now, turning to your article in the bulletin, you outline three possible paths forward to save arms control, put it that way. First is if there is no new agreement possible, we could continue to adhere to New START kind of as if it was still in force. Both sides could just respect the terms of the agreement. Second, we could negotiate a new agreement but not seek Senate ratification, some alternative like an executive agreement. And third, which I think most of us hope for, uh, we could negotiate a new treaty and get Senate approval for it. Looking at those three options, which to you is most feasible and which to you would be best overall in terms of reducing nuclear dangers? So unfortunately, those are trade-offs. The most feasible option is also the least ideal one. The, The most feasible is to just have mutual moratoria to say we're going to continue adhering to the limits or maybe have kind of a politically binding agreement here that poses some issues because number one, it's not a sustainable, one can back out rather quickly. Number two, as I mentioned before, the verification regime is really so crucial to New START and it would be quite difficult to continue verification in terms of data exchanges, notifications, on-site inspections without a treaty framework um, for legal reasons. So both sides 
would need to prepare some legal avenues to allow for those to continue in the interim. The best scenario is obviously to have a treaty and really option two, a new kind of executive agreement is technically also a treaty under international law. So the form that we've always had in the past for arms control treaties usually is a typical article two treaty. So um, under, you know, article two of the constitution where we have the Senate give advice and consent and then a two thirds vote to allow the president to ratify such a treaty. And that's really the most sustainable one because Congress feels like it has the most buy-in. It's probably bipartisan and future administrations are more likely to continue adhering to not withdraw from such treaty. So that would be the best for reducing nuclear dangers in the longer term and sustainably, but it is also the most challenging. So let's look at the first one of, you know, just kind of respecting the terms of the treaty, even if it's no longer in force. You mentioned there may be some problems with that in terms of continuing inspections. Can you tell us more about that? Practically, the U.S. and Russia could just continue adhering to the treaty limits. But in terms of data exchanges and notifications and in terms of inspections, we would have some legal challenges. So Let's look at the bilateral data exchanges and notifications first. We have in the past continued notifications as a goodwill gesture during the bridge period between start and new start. So that is something that the U.S., given this precedent, should again be feasible to arrange for. On the Russian side, we did not actually see reciprocal notifications during this period. So to that end, Russia might need to look more closely into how they can combine this with their domestic laws and continue sharing, you know, classified nuclear information, which is typically a little bit complicated legally. So they they might need to amend some domestic laws to allow this to happen under just a handshake or politically binding agreement. On the inspection side, it would also theoretically be possible for both countries to change their domestic laws to enable on-site inspections to continue in the absence of such a treaty framework. So here again, we have, you know, state secrecy laws and everything that complicate letting inspectors, foreign nationals onto your nuclear installations and giving them access. So Without a treaty to really be the overarching legal instrument to allow this, you need some other kind of domestic laws to enable this. So here, Russia has in the past raised doubts that they would be willing to do this. They were able to do this. They have been rather hesitant. I don't know if it was for political reasons that they were worried there wouldn't be enough pressure to still negotiate a legally binding treaty if they allow to, you know, inspections to happen without one, or if it's really that their domestic laws are more complicated in this, in this matter. The U.S. also has laws restricting the access of foreign nationals to sensitive military installations. And there is precedent for trying to attempt to enable this without a follow-on treaty, you know, in that kind of scenario. I think this was in 2001 where Senator Luger tabled a bill to provide those Russian inspectors the ability to continue to have access. But the bill was not passed at the time, but it, you know, just its introduction to Congress suggests that we might be able to think about something similar if if we needed to in the future again. So if we just continue to adhere to New START going forward, even though the treaty has expired, we could be facing legal problems in terms of allowing inspections and such in both countries that could be resolved with domestic law but would be difficult to do. And of course, even if we do that, we're still stuck with the New START Treaty. We're not going beyond New START, right, which is kind of what we would like to do. So, so moving on to your next option, which would be negotiating a new agreement that presumably would go beyond New START in terms of its reductions, but not trying to get Senate approval because the difficulties of that, but going for an executive agreement, which has been done before, give us the pros and cons of the executive agreement versus a treaty or versus a Senate ratified agreement. 
There are several types of executive agreements, but the two that are the most likely in the scenario are, are either a sole presidential or sole executive agreement or a congressional executive agreement. The sole executive agreement would not require the Senate's advice and consent for ratification as an Article II treaty would, but it would still be as legally binding as would the congressional executive agreement. This would be really valuable for the U.S. given the high degree of political polarization right now. (laughs) And today, actually, more than 90% of the U.S.'s international agreements are executive agreements concluded by the president. So this first one that I mentioned, the sole executive agreement. But these are not really common for arms control or national security purposes. This is more the case for trade agreements. So this is a little bit underexplored. And also there are reasons why this is underexplored because it could upset Congress as they, you know, would feel like their role in giving advice and consent and everything would really be diminished. So because agreements that are more important, such as these big nuclear arms control agreements have in the past been traditional Article II treaties, I think there would be a lot of just political backlash if the president tried to get this done through a sole executive agreement. However, there's also the congressional executive agreement, which could be almost a compromise between the sole presidential agreement and the Article II treaty. So the congressional executive agreement does not require the two-third vote in the Senate. It just requires a simple majority in both the House and the Senate. So that could be a way for Congress to still feel like they had some input, to not feel like the president just went around them, to ensure that this kind of agreement would still be sustainable with changing administrations. But it would also be a way to at least not require that two-third vote in the Senate. So assuming we could get a new agreement with Russia, What do both sides want that agreement to cover? I think both sides definitely have in their primary interest to preserve the successful framework of New START. The U.S. has quite a list of things they'd like to see included. Russia always has a few things that they keep bringing up, like missile defenses. What is realistic here, really? I think there are many things both sides might want to include. However, to be realistic and admit that Given the current circumstances, it will be quite hard to negotiate a treaty that addresses a bunch of other concerns in the short amount of time. It might just be smartest for now to reserve you know, other issues for separate instruments and to focus this specific negotiation on preserving what we have to not lose this last remaining cornerstone of strategic stability. And then address some issues that would likely also come up if this current treaty would not expire in 2026. So new types of weapons, whether, you know, Kinsal is included and maybe expanding the definition of a little bit or clarifying it to include new types of weapons that are of concern in this longer range type of scenario. Now, stepping back for a minute. I'm wondering your thoughts on how the war in Ukraine and Russia's nuclear threats have changed the way we should think about nuclear weapons and arms control going forward. Do you have any thoughts on that? So we've always said that arms control is not an end in itself, right? It's a means to ensure national security. And so given the new situation with Ukraine, but also um, with China, we need to kind of reevaluate what our goals are and then see how arms control can help us achieve those. So back during the Cold War, height of the Cold War, the main purpose of arms control was to manage strategic competition. And then Cold War ended, and especially during the New START negotiations, we were much more relaxed. It was more of a collaborative tool to, you know, manage a controlled drawdown of excess strategic forces and then have deep cuts of nuclear forces. And then we were hoping to eventually get to elimination. Right now, that seems a little bit less realistic in the near term. So the pendulum is kind of swinging back to strategic competition. And I think that we'll also have to 
reevaluate and see how we can use the right arms control tools to manage that again. And also we need to realize that it will need to be an incremental process to get to where we really want to be. Jess, thank you so much. Really appreciate this and all your time and best of luck in all your work. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, for having me. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited in Washington, D.C. by Loan Billet, Angela Kellett, and Alex Hall. Audio engineering in San Francisco by Jacqueline Shane. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco based band 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.